Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Kishwar Rizvi, an associate professor of the history of art at Yale. She is an historian of Islamic art and architecture. Professor Rizvi has written on representations of religious and imperial authority in Safavid, Iran, as well as on issues of gender, nationalism, and religious identity in modern Iran and Pakistan. She's the author of The Safavid Dynastic, Shrine, History, Religion, and Architecture in Early Modern Iran, and she's the editor of Modernism and the Middle East, Architecture and Politics in the 20th Century. Today we'll talk with Professor Rizvi about her new book project, The Transnational Mosque, Architecture and Historical Memory in the Contemporary Middle East. Welcome, Professor Rizvi. Thank you, Marilyn. So let's begin with an overview of the project. Tell us about it. Right. My book really concentrates on what is possibly the most ubiquitous form of architecture in the Muslim world generally, um, which is the mosque. Mm -hmm. um, that is, you could be in Muslim communities from China to Europe, um, from Beirut to Timbuktu, and the mosque will be the one architectural form that unites them. Um, historically, the mosque has been around since at least the time of the Prophet Muhammad, that is since the 7th century. Mm -hmm. It has evolved over time. Um, and historically, uh, it would have been patronized by rulers and the wealthy. It would have been in the center of a city. Um, but in the 20th century, the building of large monumental mosques has been co-opted by the state. Um, and that's something that I'm really interested in. in. Mm -hmm. And my book focuses on these state mosques in particular in the contemporary Middle East. Um, I focus on four countries in particular, um, that is the um, Turkish Republic, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and the United Arab Emirates. And I look at the way in which these four countries have sponsored monumental state mosques within their own borders, but also outside of their country mm -hmm. themselves. So is it only the state states that are building mosques? Are there, mm -hmm. are there any private mosques be bu being built? There are private mosques. I mean, you know, it, building a mosque is a benevolent act. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have the means, you might want to consider building a mosque or patronizing one. But what I'm really interested is in the way in which these four states, because what I argue in the book is that these four states represent what might be the vision for um, the Muslim world today. Mm -hmm. So Iran, Turkey, South Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have a vision for what they think of the Muslim community now today. Mm -hmm. And they're using these state-sponsored mosques as a way of pr propagating their ideology, disseminating their thoughts um, for what this Muslim community might be. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's my focus primarily. I'm not really looking at every type of mosque, okay. but this very particular typology. Okay. And what led you to uh, mm -hmm. this project. Mm -hmm. I was actually nominated for a Carnegie um, okay. Award a few years ago um, by a colleague at UCLA, Lynn Hunt. And the mandate of that cycle of award was to understand the Muslim world today or the modern Muslim world. Um, as you mentioned, my work has also been and primarily has been on the early modern period. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I wanted to think of was what is the role of history in modern Islam. So that was my starting point. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to look at this form of architecture, which again, as I mentioned, is ubiquitous. But since at least 30 years, modern mosques in the Middle East, or in fact, you could say all over the Islamic world, are very historical, that they make these very powerful historical references. Mm -hmm. For example, mosques um, built by the Turkish Republic um, are Ottoman in form, mm -hmm. right? So they are going back to the classical 16th century to define a particular type of architecture. And I was very curious to understand why. Why is it that they are going so far deep into the past? Um, and what does history mean in this context? Mm -hmm. So what is at stake? Um, and now, this idea of going back historically is not unique um, to the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. And certainly in the past 30 years, we've seen the rise of religion and the rise of a historical consciousness in many religious communities, whether it's fundamentalism um, seen in Christian communities or Hindu communities. So it's a very particular aspect of um, 
of this moment in time and that's what I really was curious to find out more about okay. and through the mosque as a very visible symbol sure. of that. Okay. And how did you do um, the research for the project? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm an architectural historian as you mentioned, um, so field work is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was traveling to these four countries themselves, but also to countries where I argue they sponsor or gift their ambassadorial types of state mosques. Mm -hmm. um, so I was also traveling to Syria, to Pakistan, to Europe, um, Germany, and other parts in the Middle East, which I think are sort of connected through through these four primary sites. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing um, photo documentation, architectural documentation, trying to understand who was using the mosques, um, so there's some sort of anthropological aspect to it. I was able, um, in many cases, to interview the builders, the architects, um, and in some cases, the patrons. Mm -hmm. So there's many, many levels um, with which I was trying to understand the institution from very different angles. Mm -hmm. Does it vary from country to country? Mm -hmm. Very much so okay. in terms of the architectural patronage mm -hmm. and what it means, you know. Um, so, uh, for example, as I'd mentioned, the Turkish Republic is mm -hmm. building these sort of what would be known as neo-Ottoman mosques, mm -hmm. um, but they're building them in very different um, parts of the world, um, from Tokyo to Turkmenistan to Germany, um, and more close by as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the way in which the Turkish Republic is defining its spheres of influence, if you will, is very different from, say, um, Iran, mm -hmm. right, that is using Shiism, for example, as its link okay. and what's binding it. So um, the Iranian government has sponsored a great deal of mosque building and shrine reconstructions in Syria, mm -hmm. in Iraq, in Lebanon. Um, so, so each of these countries has a very different way of going about this sponsorship mm -hmm. and that's what I was really curious to find out more. Okay and let's define the term transnational mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. a traditional mosque. Right. You mentioned them building mosques in other countries. Is that exactly. part of the transnational term? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And, 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 and I think what I wanted to do was to try and find a way of distinguishing um, this idea of say the global Right, because that's a term that has also been used mm -hmm. when we're talking about the contemporary period. Um, uh, there are other ways of thinking, would say mobilities is another way in which people have talked about communities going beyond national borders and certainly media and so on allow us to do that. Um, but what I argue in the book and why I really am committed to the term transnational is that I think the nation is still at the center of uh, political discourse, particularly in the contemporary Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, that is to say that the types of decision making, public policy, um, the way in which publics are created themselves are really from the point of view of the state mm -hmm. and the nation. And so whether the buildings are within the sovereign boundaries of a country such as Iran or Turkey or the United Arab Emirates or outside, um, I argue that it's still the national that is playing into these decisions making. Mm -hmm. And h how is that decision making reflected mm -hmm. in the actual building of the mosque? I mean, right. can you speak to specific countries? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. No, certainly. Um, so the choices for example, where these mosques will be built, okay. right? Um, so for example, the Saudi government um, in the 1980s um, sponsored a, what is now understood to be the National Mosque in Pakistan, mm -hmm. in Islamabad, which is known as the King Faisal Mosque. It was completed in 1986, and it's named after King Faisal, who was the ruler of Saudi Arabia um, before his death. Um, and uh, this mosque is given as a gift, in a sense, to the people of Pakistan. Now, as you know, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan have very long traditional ties, um, political ties, ideological ties. And that link is reinforced through this monumental mosque. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's named after King Faisal, even though it's built in Pakistan, okay. um, continues that link. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, um, the, the, the government of Abu Dhabi um, has built what is now understood to be the second largest mosque in and around Jerusalem after the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which was built in the um, end of the 7th century, um, which is named after Sheikh Zayed, 
um, the sort of founder and the ideologue of the United Arab Emirates. Okay. Um, and so what they're doing is really creating, um, as I mentioned, alliances. Now in some cases, as I mentioned, uh, religion might be what defines that connection. Mm -hmm. So for Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, or for Iran and Syria. Um, in other cases, it might be some linguistic or ethnic identity. For example, Turkey, um, when they are building for their diasporas um, or for what they see as um, uh, their political links to the post-Soviet republics, mm -hmm. right, which are Turkic. Um, and they have a linguistic and ethnic connection to Turkey, although they're thousands of miles away. Mm -hmm. So they're making a different kind of a connection right, right. and resurrecting the Ottoman Empire mm -hmm. in a way to make that link. How many mosques are being built around the country? I mean, mm -hmm. are many being, being, being built a, or is it, yeah. you know, one or two here or there? That's a wonderful question. Um, and again, it varies. Mm -hmm. um, so. Primarily, one would argue that uh, when the states uh, are building their national mosque, it is often one in their capital, mm -hmm. so that would be the primary mosque. Um, but interestingly, what they build outside of their own borders mm -hmm. are not limited. Um, they are strategically placed within other capital cities mm -hmm. or, um, or in other areas where there might be some reason to be. For example, again, the United Arab Emirates is building a very monumental mosque in Shimkent. Um, and one of the reasons is because they're both oil producing nations. Mm -hmm. Now that's not a very big capital and one hardly knows very much about mm -hmm. it. But once you dig a little bit deeper, you realize that there's a lot of oil that is being um, uh, surveyed and brought out um, in that region. Mm -hmm. And so there's a commercial venture. There's a commercial connection that is being brought up mm -hmm. between these two oil producing nations. Right, And it, it must help to strengthen the ties between the two. It's kind exactly. of a diplomatic gift almost. Absolutely. Yes. Exactly. Okay. And that's what I do call them. I uh -huh. call them uh, diplomatic mm -hmm. or ambassadorial mosques mm -hmm. um, because they pre precisely perform right. that function. So looking at the, uh, the history of the mosque mm -hmm. over time, mm -hmm. has the political significance of the mosque changed? Mm -hmm. I think um, the mosque has always been um, a space of political action. Mm -hmm. um, historically, um, it was believed that um, the first mosque was the Prophet Muhammad's house, where he met with his community. Mm -hmm. And they discussed ideas about where that community was going, what was next, and so on. So the mosque has traditionally and continues to be a place where the community gathers. Mm -hmm. um, and and discusses its sort of agenda, its vision. Um, and uh, uh, it would have traditionally been the purview of the ruler, for example, to decide what was being discussed in the sermon. Mm -hmm. For example, um, the Friday mosque or the congregational mosque, which, what, which is what these um, large uh, state-sponsored national mosques mm -hmm. are, um, are places where the Muslim community meets on Friday afternoons. So that sort of is the major day that one sort of congregates. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, there will be a sermon um, and a khutbah, as it's known, in which um, the most important issues of the day are going to be discussed, right? So that is uh, politics, mm -hmm. most often than not. In fact, the Iranian government, for example, today um, vets the sermons that are going to be presented at these Friday mosques mm -hmm. and then they're disseminated throughout the country. So it remains and continues to be a very political space. Um, and, and even as it impacts the sort of superstructure of, of people's lives, it's also the mosque is also part of the everyday life of mm -hmm. people, right? So it's, it's a community space. Um, and I think that intersection is what makes it such a powerful um, symbol mm -hmm. for the contemporary world, right. even now. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm wondering when a country wants to build mm. a mosque outside of its own country, yeah. um, I would imagine that that country needs to have a buy-in. And have you, when talking with the, ar the architects, mm -hmm. what is that process like? Did you discuss that at all? Right. Well, well um, let's think of the example of um, what is known as the Amin Mosque mm -hmm. um, in Beirut. And I had the opportunity to meet with the architect, Azmi Fakhuri, who uh, was very forthcoming, very interesting. He's a local Beiruti architect. Mm -hmm. um, the Amin Mosque is 
huge. It's right in the center next to Martyr Square. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most monumental buildings in Beirut. Um, it was funded by the Saudi government. Um, and it's something that uh, was negotiated between, at that time, um, uh, Rafiq Hariri, who was um, the president, and uh, the Saudi government, with which he had very strong historical ties mm -hmm. because he had lived there and his company was there as well. Um, so it was negotiated, and that's what is interesting about this, the types of negotiations that take place between countries, mm -hmm. right? Like what, for instance? Well, you know, for example, that this is a gift that is being given. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Lebanese government at the time recognized that they needed a symbol of uh, their authority um, and their strongest supporters were the Saudis. Um, and so they went to them and said, you know, we need to build this mosque. It has to be Martyr Square. That whole area had been devastated. Mm -hmm. um, and they needed to build something. As you know, of course, um, Beirut is divided mm -hmm. by religious factionalism, sectarianism. Um, and so to build this huge mosque, which interestingly enough looks also Ottoman. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be inspired, according to the architect, by the Blue Mosque in Istanbul. Oh, okay. Um, a lot of these mosques are inspired by the Blue Mosque mm -hmm. in Istanbul um, for, for <laughs> very interesting reasons. And wh why? I am curious. Well, well you know, it's, in, it's interesting because that was, um, or it's understood today to be the symbol of the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. which of course, you know, was the longest ra uh, running. I mean, it was, you know, in existence for almost 600 years. This was the caliphate. Um, this was the most powerful Muslim empire historically, mm -hmm. and up, you know, from uh, 1200 and uh, something until 1918. So, you know, almost 600 years the Ottomans ruled mm -hmm. over a very broad swath of land from, you know, the reaches of Europe to North Africa to Asia. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the Ottomans are held in high regard by everyone or most people at least. Mm -hmm. And so it was interesting to see that even for the Saudi government when they're sponsoring a mosque in Beirut, they are using that symbol. But in a very different and distinct way mm -hmm. than the Turkish government itself. Okay. So, so there's these negotiations being taken that are taking place between the governments, between local actors. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, the Amin Mosque was opened, for example, um, the Mufti of Beirut um, was brought in to pray there and to help inaugurate it. So many different members mm -hmm. of the community and of the city were mobilized mm -hmm. in order to inaugurate this building. Okay. And what about the um, mosque moving forward? Mm -hmm. What do you think the future holds? Well, you know, what has been really interesting to me has been to realize that in each of these countries, the idea of the mosque is quite distinct mm -hmm. and has evolved in, in the past 30 years as a very distinct entity. So, for example, in Ankara, the, the large, what would be considered state mosque, is the Koja Tepe Mosque. It was built um, through the support of the Refa, what had been the Refa Party, the welfare party at the time. Um, it projects this incredible populism. The whole ground floor of it is a, a supermarket mm -hmm. and a parking lot. Wow. Um, so people come, they park their cars, they do a little shopping, then they that's go That's very unusual, isn't it's, it? Well, actually it's not. And that's wow. what's so interesting. That he, uh, I've never heard of that. Yes, well, you know, mosques often had a foundation that was attached to them. They were close to a bazaar mm -hmm. or they were close to some other kind of commercial venture that helped supplement its own income. Okay. And that would have been an endowment that was part of the mosque. Well, what the Kojatepe has done is taken this modern form, right, mm -hmm. of the supermarket, of the parking garage. But indeed, typologically, it's not that distinct. Mm -hmm. um, but what it has done is it's responding to its time. Right. Right. So the it's needs. got this incredible populism, consumerism to it. Mm -hmm. And so that projects an idea of what the Turkish government sees as its pillars of strength now. Right. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah, and I would imagine it yeah. really draws people to the mosque for Absolutely. a variety of a reasons. A variety of yeah. reasons from Quran classes for children, mm -hmm. for adults learning Arabic, um, a whole slew of activities mm -hmm. take place there. Now, in contrast, and I think this is also interesting to note, is that the United Arab Emirates, for example, has its national mosques, for example, the Zayed Mosque in Abu Dhabi, which is monumental. It's incredibly large and beautiful. 
they um, have not chosen one style because the, the, the idea was that Sheikh Zayed wanted to build a country and a nation that brought people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so that mosque makes references to many different historical periods, many different countries. Mm -hmm. They've brought in artisans from India, from North Africa. Um, the design of, of the mosaics is by this British artist. Wow, quite so a they project. brought the world to themselves, mm -hmm. and that's part of the way in which the United Arab Emirates wants to project its vision of Islam. Mm -hmm. Second, these mosques, the state mosques in the United Arab Emirates are also community centers, but also um, cultural centers. Mm -hmm. So they are open to non-Muslims. And they see as part of their mandate um, to be open to a very wide community, to teach them about Islam, and to project a vision of a tolerant, progressive Islam. Mm -hmm. So that is very different from what the Turkish case is. Okay. But it tells us a lot about how the United Arab Emirates sees itself today mm -hmm. and moving forward. So the mosque is part of this sort of idea. It's part of the vision for these countries and how they want to see themselves both within their own national sovereign borders, but also how they want to project themselves to the world. Okay. And that's why it's been such an exciting project, mm -hmm. you know, to discover both this internal and external discourse. And when, when can we expect your book to be out? Next year, okay. inshallah. We will look, <laughs> Next we will fall. look forward to <laughs> Next seeing fall. that. Thank you so much for being Thank here with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. For more information about Professor Rizvi and her research, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.